If you have your Bibles, look with me in Romans 3 and beginning in verse 21. Romans 3 and beginning in verse 21. Let's talk about the heart of the gospel this morning. The heart of the gospel. There is a water baptism uh, next Sunday afternoon. Uh, if you haven't been baptized in water since you've become a believer in Jesus, I'm not going to tell you to pray about it. I'm going to tell you to just do it. Just sign up and do it. It's a step of obedience. Jesus said to be baptized. And uh, there's a baptism class in the morning during the morning services and then baptism in the afternoon next weekend. Pray you all have a very blessed 4th of July. Uh, Lord be with you. And pray for America. Pray for our country. Um, we so thankful for this country that the Lord has uh, given us and for all the freedoms that we enjoy. Uh, but America needs God right now. So just take some time over this holiday to pray. All right, look with me. Romans 3.21. Paul says, but now, apart from the law, a righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and are falling short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by the same faith. Do we then nullify this law by faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Let's pray. Jesus, help us to just receive your words. Give us the ability to grasp, to understand. Lord, let every spirit of distraction, Lord, be silenced. And I pray that you'd open our hearts to receive your words. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. With so many different religions in the world, how can we Christians insist that Jesus is the only way to heaven? How can we insist that the Christian gospel is right and that every other religion is false? Isn't that just a little overconfident? Isn't that just maybe a little short-sighted or a little intolerant? Well, for one thing, since we're followers of Jesus, this is what Jesus taught himself. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He said, I am the door of salvation. Everyone who enters through me will be saved. Not only is this what Jesus taught, but it's what the first Christians believed and what the apostles taught, as we see here in Paul's words in Romans 3. For the last few weeks, we've been reading the letter of Romans together, and today we come to some of the most important verses in the entire Bible. There was a pastor in Philadelphia named Donald Barnhouse, and he taught the book of Romans for 18 years straight on the radio. You think it's taken me a long time to get through the book of Romans? <laughs> and in his Bible, he took a pen and he drew a heart around these verses that we read this morning, Romans 3, 21 through 26, because he said, this is the heart of the gospel. I know some people don't like to write in their Bibles, but I like to make little notes to help me remember the things I've learned along the way because I forget a little bit. And if you are one of those people who does make notes in your Bible, maybe right here by Romans 3.21, you can draw a little heart and you can just write the heart of the gospel to help you remember how important these verses are. 
The New Testament scholar Leon Morris called these the greatest paragraph ever written. There was an English poet named William Cowper. He was saved in a mental asylum. A worker in the asylum left a Bible intentionally on a garden bench for William Cowper to find. And when he picked up the Bible, he opened to Romans chapter 3. And when he read these verses, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, he found freedom in Jesus. He wrote the words to the hymn, maybe you know it, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. These verses contain a glossary of salvation words, sin and grace and justification and redemption and propitiation, the word demonstration, the word pardon, the word reckoned or accounted as, the word free gift are all packed into this little passage of verses. Looking at Paul's words, I find that the cross is God's solution to four salvation problems that we all face. And I want to share about it with you quickly this morning. The cross is God's solution to four salvation problems that we all face. The first problem is the problem of sin. A while back ago, I had the opportunity to meet one of the most famous pastors in the world. There was a survey recently of spiritual influence in America, and he ranked higher than the Pope and Billy Graham on that survey. He had a lot of good things to say, but there was one thing that he said that didn't quite sit right with me. He said, I never tell people that they're sinners because they already know it. People don't need to be told they're sinners. They just need to be told how to be saved. I've thought about that a lot since I met him, and I have to say that I'm not sure I can agree completely. First of all, Jesus talked about sin, and Peter and John and Luke and Paul after him. But I also find that while many people know that they're sinners, many people don't believe that their sin is a big problem. After all, nobody's perfect. Maybe my friend is right. Maybe people do already know that they're sinners, but they also need to know that their sin is a very big problem. Last week, we talked from Romans 3 about the string of Old Testament quotations that describe the total depravity of man. Total depravity doesn't mean that every person is as bad as he or she could be. It means that every person is infected with sin. And every part of our person is affected by sin. Paul uses in that string of quotations, he uses different body parts to show that from head to toe, we are all affected by sin. Someone put it this way, if sin were the color blue, then every part of us would be some shade of blue. And it's true. Paul comes to a sweeping indictment of mankind. He says every mouth is silenced and the whole world is accountable before God. And then in Romans 3.23, he says all have sinned and are falling short of the glory of God. That word sin means to miss the mark. Another way it can be translated is to stray from the path, to wander from God's path. All of us have sinned. All of us have wandered from God's path. And because of it, we are lacking something. That word falling short means to lack something. Because we've wandered, we're lacking something. And what we're lacking is the glory of God. And that is a very big problem. If my friend is right... I don't need to tell anyone here this morning that you're a sinner. You already know that. But perhaps you don't need, know what a very big problem sin is. So let me tell you that. <laughs> sin is a big problem because it offends God and it separates us from him. Beloved, it's important to realize that every sin we commit is a sin against God. The sins that we commit against one another, ultimately we commit against him. You might remember that David committed adultery with a married woman. 
And then he came up with a cockamamie scheme to cover it up. And when that failed, he murdered the woman's husband and killed several other men in the process. And he made his best friend an accessory to the murder. And after all of that, when it finally comes out in the wash, David prays a prayer of repentance and he says to God, against you and you only have I sinned. Really, David? Not for nothing, but he had sinned against a lot of people. But David's point is that all sin is first against God. Sin robs God of the glory that he is due from us and through us. You know, the whole reason that God created us is to glorify him. The whole reason that God created us is to give him praise, not just with our mouth, but with all of our life. And when we wander from that path, we lack the glory that we're supposed to give him. Everything in creation looks at us and the excellence that they see in us is supposed to point to the excellency of the one who made us in his image. And so when we wander from God's path, we lack the glory that is supposed to go to God through our lives. Sin robs us of the glory of God's presence with us. The Jewish people believed that in the garden, Adam and Eve were actually clothed with the glory of God. And when they disobeyed, they were separated from God's presence and they were stripped of that glory covering. And that is how fallen mankind has remained ever since. We are lacking God's glory. We are lacking God's presence with us. For all have sinned, all have strayed from God's path, and we lack that glory of His presence. I know you already know you're a sinner, but do you know how big of a problem it is? Sin is a big problem because it dominates us. We talked last week about Paul's words from Romans 3, 9, where he says we are all under sin. We are all under the power of sin. We are all enslaved by sin, imprisoned by sin. Sin blurs the image of God inside of us. We were created in the image of God, and David says we were crowned with God's glory. But sin has marred that image. It has twisted us and broken us. If sin were the color blue, every part of us is some shade of blue. And that in turn ruins our relationships with others. For all have sinned, all have wandered from God's path, and now we are lacking his glory. We are lacking his image that he created us with. I know you already know you're a sinner, but do you know how big of a problem that is? Sin is a big problem because it condemns us to death. In Romans 6.23, Paul says that the wages of sin is death. And in that verse, death is put forward as the opposite of eternal life. Death is the eternal loss of those who die in their sins. Paul says that sin provokes God's righteous wrath. Now, God's wrath isn't like human anger. God doesn't have a bad temper. He doesn't have a bad day and lose it. God's wrath is the steady administration of his justice. And Paul says that those who continue in their sin are storing up wrath against themselves for the day of wrath. Beloved, look at me for one minute. Everybody look if you would. Sin is a big problem. Because at the end of all things, there is going to be a judgment day when God reveals all the secrets of men and he judges us all according to his truth. Don't you worry about the headlines. Don't you worry about the cover-ups and the lies and the scams. God keeps perfect books. And one day all the secrets of men will be revealed. See, it doesn't matter how you are remembered on earth. All that matters is how you are known in heaven. And all those who die in their sins will not inherit eternal life, but they will suffer eternal loss. As my friend Jackson Sinyanga says, I don't say this to scare you, beloved. I say this to terrify you. I know you know you're a sinner, but do you know how big of a problem it is? 
Do you know about the wages of sin? Do you know about the wrath of God? Do you know about the last judgment? Do you know about eternal life and eternal loss? God's solution for our sin problem is justification through the cross of Jesus Christ. All have sinned. All have wandered from God's path. And we are lacking His glory. We are lacking His praise. We are lacking His image in us. We are lacking His presence both here on earth and ultimately in heaven. We are lacking those things. But all are justified freely by His grace. Justification is a metaphor from the courtroom. It means to be found in the right. Although we are clearly in the wrong, God declares us to be in the right. Justification is something more than forgiveness. It means to receive a change in spiritual status. You see, sin is not just the things we have done. Sin is a status. We are under sin. And justification means that we have had a change in status so that we are no longer under sin. We are in Christ instead. Although I am a sinner, when God looks at me, he doesn't hold my sin against me or regard me as a sinner. The line isn't new, but it's still true. Justification means that when God looks at me, he sees me just as if I'd never sinned. Justification means that God considers Jesus' righteousness my own righteousness. We don't earn it. By being religious or trying to be good, God gives it to us by his grace. Maybe this little picture could help you. I have a friend who ministers in Southeast Asia. You know him. Many years ago, he and one of his staff members were deported from a communist country for preaching the gospel. Their names were put on a list of people who were banned from ever entering that country again. In fact, when they arrested him, they interrogated them, held them for several days, and then they took them to the airport in handcuffs in a big military uh, entourage, and they took him to the door of the airplane, and they released the cuffs right when they were at the door of the plane, and they said, don't ever come back to our country again. But before they left the country, the general who was overseeing the whole arrest and the whole deportation had a wife who was terminally ill. And our friend prayed for the general's wife. And a few days after they left the country, the Lord miraculously healed her. I mean, miraculously healed her. <clears throat> a few years later, our friend heard the Lord very clearly tell him to go back to that country. He said, but Lord, my status there is banned. The Lord said, apply for a visa. Sure enough, he discovered that his name had not only been removed from the banned list, but it had been put on a VIP list of <laughs> dignitaries and diplomats, people who receive special treatment. So the next time he traveled to that country, he received a hero's welcome. They met him at the airplane, and he didn't know what was going on. He thought, oh, here we go again. And they escorted him off the plane, but this time they took him to a VIP lounge. And they served him food and drink while they took his passport. He didn't stand in a customs line or uh, in an immigration line. They processed all his paperwork, and then they sent men to pick up his bags and carry them to a government limo that was waiting. And they drove him to the hotel with an escort of police riding on motorcycles all around. Interestingly, his staff member that had been deported with him was left on the band list. The general forgot his name. <laughs> and even though my friend brings groups of 20 or 30 people every year into that country, the one who was banned has never been permitted to enter again. Do you know that's a very good picture of justification? All have sinned, all have wandered from God's path, and because of it, we are all lacking God's glory. Our status is banned from his presence. But those who have been justified, God has changed our status from banned to VIP status. 
Not only are we welcome, we are welcome with open arms. We are welcome with fanfare. We're going to get an angelic escort home someday to the glory of God and an angelic ovation when we get there. Now here's the interesting thing. Both men were guilty of the same crime of proselytizing. In fact, truth be told, my friend was much more guilty than the staff member who was with him merely to carry his bags. And yet one found favor and his status was changed and the other remained banned forever. That's justification. How does the cross solve the problem of sin? It provides justification for salvation problems solved by the cross. The problem of sin, the second problem, is the problem of justice. The problem of justice. Everybody look at me for one minute. In solving one problem, justification creates another problem. How is this at all fair? How is it fair for God to call guilty people innocent? In the Old Testament, God strictly forbade his people to call someone guilty innocent or to call someone innocent guilty. So how can God do what he himself forbids others to do? How can God look at two equally guilty people and say to one, you are banned, and say to the other one, welcome VIP? The answer is that God doesn't forgive sinners arbitrarily. He forgives us on the basis of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Paul says here that God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement. Another way to say that is he presented Jesus as a sacrifice of, now don't get scared, of propitiation. All right, I know that word is a mouthful, but don't let it throw you off. It just means satisfaction. Our sins have provoked God's wrath, but Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, cross propitiated. It satisfied God's wrath. This is a metaphor from the Jewish temple. Paul says in Romans 3 that the Old Testament scriptures testify about this righteousness from God. Where do they do that? Well, one place is in the whole Jewish sacrificial system. The Jewish people always knew that the sacrifices in the temple pointed forward to some ultimate fulfillment. They knew that God would one day provide a once and for all sacrifice that would permanently satisfy God's wrath. Isaiah prophesied about the righteous servant who was coming, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, to cause him to suffer and to make his life an offering for sin. Listen, the Lord will see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Through knowledge of him, my righteous servant will justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. The Jewish people always knew that those sacrifices in the temple were pointing forward to some ultimate fulfillment. That's why when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How can it be fair for God to call sinners righteous? How can God fairly call guilty people innocent? How can he fairly change someone's status from banned to VIP? God doesn't do it arbitrarily. God has just grounds for doing it. You see, our guilt has been transferred on to an innocent sacrifice, Jesus. God's Wrath has been satisfied, the price has been paid, and the innocence of the sacrificial victim has been transferred onto us. Paul uses a third metaphor here. Justification is a metaphor from the courthouse. Propitiation is a metaphor from the temple. The third metaphor is redemption, and it's a metaphor from the slave market. In Romans 3, 9, Paul says we are all under sin. We are all enslaved by sin. But what Jesus did on the cross redeemed us. That word redeemed means a ransom price has been paid. In Paul's day, slaves could be freed by the payment of a ransom price. Prisoners of war could be freed by the payment of a ransom price. Condemned criminals could be freed by the payment of a ransom price. 
So Jesus' sacrifice on the cross not only satisfied God's wrath, but it also paid the ransom that purchased our freedom. You see, what God has done, he hasn't done arbitrarily. God has done fair and square through the cross of Christ. Four salvation problems solved by the cross. The problem of sin, the problem of justice. The third problem is the problem of world religions, specifically Judaism and Christianity. How can we as Christians insist that Jesus is the only way? What about all the other world religions out there? And specifically, what about Judaism to whom we owe everything? Not only did Jesus himself teach that he's the only way to God, but Paul taught it as well, and he teaches it right here in Romans 3. Paul says there is only one God, and one God has made one way of salvation through Jesus. He is the God of all people. He is the God of the Jews and all the Gentiles, and God has made only one way, Jesus. If you still have your Bibles open, look at Romans 3.22. Look at Romans 3.22. Paul says, This righteousness comes from God through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. Look at his words. There is no difference. There is no difference. If you are Jewish, if you are Gentile, if you are Russian or Chinese or African or South American, there is no difference. All have sinned and are falling short of God's glory and all are justified freely by his grace. Just as all people are guilty the same way, all people are saved the same way, the only way through Jesus. Now listen, Paul's words here don't mean that all people are saved automatically. They don't mean that they are justified automatically. Paul simply means that Jesus is the only way to be justified. Paul uses the Jewish people as his prime example. Well, Paul, if you say that Jesus is the only way, well, what about all those Jewish people in the Old Testament that died before Jesus came? Paul says, aha. He said, God suspended temporarily their sentence until Jesus could come. Paul says that the cross was God's ultimate demonstration of his love on the world stage. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice publicly. What happened to Jesus didn't happen behind the walls of the temple. It didn't happen in some hidden enclave of Jerusalem. Jesus was publicly executed up on a cross, high up on a hill where everybody could see it. Everybody in Jerusalem knew what happened to Jesus. You remember the disciples walking on the road to Emmaus after the crucifixion. And they said there's nobody in Jerusalem who doesn't know what happened to Jesus. Within 20 years, everybody in the Roman Empire knew what happened to Jesus. When Paul was on trial before King Agrippa, he said the things that happened to Jesus didn't happen in a corner. They were public and everybody saw it and everybody knew about it. And guess what? 2,000 years later, everybody is still talking about it. The cross is perhaps the most recognizable religious symbol in the world. And indeed, all of time itself, all of human history is measured out in relationship to the cross. Jesus said, if I be lifted up on the cross, I will draw all men unto me. Beloved, that's why we never stop talking about the cross. That's why we never stop reflecting on the meaning of the cross. I like what our friend Tim Keller in Manhattan said. He said, the cross is not just the first stair step on a stairway to salvation. And after we cross that step, we move on and we forget about it. No, he said, the cross is like the hub in the center of the wheel. All the spokes to connect, connect to it. And we never forget about the cross. We never stop celebrating the cross in worship. We're going to celebrate communion. It's a celebration of the cross, of what Christ has done. We never stop telling others about the cross. 
I don't know whether you've noticed driving in, but the center of our new sanctuary is a giant cross. It's 20 feet wide and it's 50 feet high. And just in case people miss it, there's going to be another cross out on the front lawn because we want to be doubly sure that everybody who drives by this place knows that we are people here who celebrate the cross. (laughs) That we are people who are gathered because of the cross, that we preach the cross. There is no difference. All have sinned and are falling short of the glory of God. All are on the banned list and all change their status only one way. Through the cross of Christ. The Old Testament Jewish people were saved looking ahead in faith at the cross of Jesus Christ. The Jewish sacrificial system pointed to them and they believed in faith in that ultimate sacrifice. They didn't know the details, but they knew what God had said. We are saved the same way. We are saved by looking back in history at that demonstration on the world stage and in believing, but all people of all time are saved one way through his cross. Four salvation problems solved by the cross. The problem of sin. The problem of justice. The problem of world religions. And finally, I'm going to throw one more million dollar word at you and then we're done. I'm leaving for Nepal, so I'll give you a break for two weeks. Here's one more word. The last problem, worship team, come help me. The last word is the problem, you ready for it, of antinomianism. (laughs) Don't get scared. Nomos is the law. Anti is against So it just means lawlessness. The problem of lawlessness. Look at me for one minute. While justification solves one problem, it creates another problem. If we're not saved by keeping the law, if we're not saved by trying to be good, then we're off the hook. We don't have to worry about the law. We don't have to worry about what it says. We don't have to worry about the righteous standard of the law. Anything goes. This is called antinomianism or lawlessness. Paul closes with a question. He says, since this righteousness comes by faith apart from the law, does that mean we can throw out the law? Does that mean we don't need it anymore? Does that mean that it's righteous standards no longer apply to us. Beloved, can I tell you that there are some believers today who think that way. That since salvation is all about what Christ has done, it doesn't matter what I do. God doesn't care. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Christian pastor who died in a Nazi concentration camp. He had a word for that kind of thinking. He called it cheap grace. Do we ignore the law? Paul says, no, not at all. Rather, we uphold the law for the first time in history. In Romans 2.28, Paul already gave us a sneak preview of how we do that. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. The result in this change of status, the result in this removal of guilt, the result of this freedom from imprisonment to sin is that I have now received the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives me the power to do what has never been done before in history. The Holy Spirit gives me the power to fulfill not only the letter of the law, but he gives me the power to fulfill the spirit of the law that Jesus described in the Sermon on the Mount. In Romans 8, Paul says, God sent his son to be a sin offering in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to our flesh but who walk according to the Holy Spirit. There's one more salvation word I need to hit you with and then we're done. And that's the word faith. The word faith appears 10 times in these 10 verses. And faith is the way that we receive God's free gifts of grace. Paul's words in Romans 3.24 don't mean that all are justified automatically. Ten times Paul tells us in ten verses that faith is the catalyst for salvation. 
The way we get our status changed is by faith. The way that we receive the removal of guilt, the way that we receive the beautiful of the Holy Spirit is all by faith. Faith looks at the public demonstration of God's love and justice on the cross and it simply believes. It simply trusts in that and that alone for salvation. Faith adds nothing to God's free gift. No religious exercises, no self-improvement projects, no good deeds. Faith simply rests in what Christ has done on his cross. Eliza Hewitt wrote an old hymn called My Faith Has Found the Resting Place. And in the hymn, she wrote the words, I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Someone described faith this way. It's simply the hand of the heart that reaches out and receives what God has offered us so freely and adds nothing to it. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then the Gentile, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that comes by faith from first to the last, for as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that is the heart of the gospel. Would you stand to give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place?